This is the most accurate card I could pull today. And just so you know, I pull them randomly every single video. So accurate because I'm about to teach you some shit. Greetings and welcome to another video about herbalism. And yes, we are talking about herbal witchcraft today. I don't know why I keep doing all these weird hand things. And I know this is a pagan's guide to herbalism. However, I don't know about you, but most of the pagans that I know, including myself, also practice a form of witchcraft and vice versa. A lot of witches practice different forms of paganism, whether it's, you know, Wicca or Druidism or shamanism or whatever. Or like you could be a witch that's an atheist or a Muslim, like that's cool too. Many witches are herbalists. And we see a lot of overlap between paganism and witchcraft, whether it's historically or in modern times today. To make this more of a visual interpretation, um, I'll show a little image that I made right here. I drew this diagram right here that shows paganism and witchcraft as the two larger circles and herbalism is in the center because there is great overlap between the two. It makes this concept a little bit easier to understand and it gives you a visual because I don't know about you but I like visuals and if you want to get really technical I mean you could basically put herbalism in the middle of like paganism and witchcraft versus you know this religion and that religion but herbalism is all just kind of in the middle because every single culture has its own uses and traditional like um, values of plants and different types of plants in their environment and I could really go on forever. So now that I've fucking explained that for like 20 minutes, um, let's dive into the real stuff that's in this video. But first I should have you know if you haven't watched the first video of this series, I highly suggest you go back to it and watch it. Not so you can stare at my face again for another long session, but because uh, it's it's relevant and I'm probably going to be referencing it or telling you some things that I've already talked about and I don't want to explain it again. So um, yeah, just go back and watch it. I'll wait, like I'll be right here, I'll be ready. One more time, I'll be really brief because everybody hates disclaimers, including me, but maybe that's because, I don't know, they're like important. If you want to do an herbal remedy that is based solely on these videos, please do your own research just so there's no allergic reactions or damage to your household in any way. That's it. It's short and sweet. There are many different ways to use herbs in the craft um, and you may be familiar with all of these, but for the baby witches that just kind of need a very basic and easy way to explain it and someone to explain it all in one sitting. Here are some common ways. So number one, by burning herbs. Number two, by ingesting, as in, you know, eating or drinking. They can be applied topically, as in being um, rubbed onto the skin with like salves, creams, or oils, or they can be soaked into the skin by a ritual bath. By putting herbs in spell jars or sachets, they can be left as offerings on an altar or a sacred space, whether it's inside or outside in nature. They can be hung as a seasonal decoration or a sign of protection or they can be grown for environmental purposes um, or a spiritual connection as in like growing a, a garden of, of any kind like a fairy garden or a spiritual garden, elemental garden, moon garden, anything. So what are these origins? Where do all of these uses come from? Why do witches use herbs this way? And some of these may be obvious to you as in like eating or drinking or being applied topically. So I will give you a great tip here for future practices that you may do. Um, the best way to take in any kind of oils from a plant is not by ingesting it, but actually applying it topically on the skin. That's the fastest way that'll be absorbed into the bloodstream. That's my text messages. So many cultures and communities would burn herbs and had the belief that burning these herbs give off a magical or medicinal purpose. Like Native Americans and the Celts perform the art of smudging with sage or oak moss and other various sacred herbs. 
the indigenous peoples of the Amazon burned Palo Santo for ceremonies. Herb jars and bags originated mostly from African cultures with their mojo bags or from gypsy tribes and cultures with the putsy bag. I think I'm saying that right, but please let me know if I'm not saying that right. But it's spelled P-U-T-S-I. And usually in these bags, they usually have like a personal item within it. These bags usually promoted a traditional use of protect protection, curing ailments, conjuring positivity, and as a personal treasure. Offerings are actually a part of so many different cultures and probably the best example is the Aztec tradition of Dia de los Muertos, which is the Day of the Dead, and they consist of leaving offerings or la ofrenda um, to a deceased loved one or an ancestor. So by hanging herb bundles in various different environments or houses, um, it usually is allowing good energies in, or in some cases hexing a house if you, you know, place it secretly, but let's not talk about that. In ancient Rome, wreaths were hung on doors to represent victory, and the Spartans, and no, not you MSU fans, not talking about you, the Spartans of ancient Greece made wreaths out of bay laurel, which is bay leaves, and olive leaves as Olympic game prizes, and in Celtic cultures, wreaths were hung to protect the house. In Christian Germanic cultures, wreaths were hung in December as a reminder that spring is around the corner. This practice probably originated from some pagan cultures, but it's hard to kind of pinpoint where. So the purpose of growing gardens for spirits to be attracted to is actually introduced to the U.S. in 1893 by a Japanese pavilion at the Chicago World's Fair. This was a display of a bonsai dish garden. Um, however, the tradition of having these kind of gardens for particular purposes covered so many different cultures, but most commonly the Celtic origin of fairies, whether good or bad, um, kind of has the idea of attracting gardens or attracting good fairies to this area. Now, in China, there happens to be this thing where there's the four main gardens of China, and where I lived, there was actually one of them, and I think, if I recall right, there's like one garden in Beijing, and then two around the Shanghai area, and then one in Yangzhou, which is where I lived. This garden had a like symbol, like different sections in the garden that consisted of the four different seasons, so that is a very good example of having a kind of spiritual garden in a way. Now, some witches today make gardens to honor the seasons, like in China, or by planting crops that grow in different times of the year, or they honor spirits of any kind through their gardens. I mean, I could really go on. And I'm mentioning all of these different ways, the way that culture used these herbs in the past because it is very relevant to how we use herbs in our practice today. And there is overlap between traditions and different cultures in the way that they use herbs. And it's almost kind of like how I mentioned earlier how there's overlap between paganism and witchcraft. Witchcraft didn't derive from paganism and many cultures under the umbrella of paganism don't necessarily practice witchcraft in the same way. Not everybody practices and uses herbs the same way. However, there are many similarities amongst them all. Medicinal and magical properties of herbs are wildly, widely recognized throughout the world, so of course there will be overlap amongst using them. You know, you may be part of a culture that uses different herbs and different remedies for a particular purpose, and meanwhile some other culture might have a different purpose for this herb, but they're all kind of overlapping into one great awesome globe, you know? Like everybody does something a little bit differently. So now you understand how herbs are used in these various ways, but why? Why are they so widely popular to work with in the first place? You are literally working with another organism, an organism that makes food and reproduces. Now chlorophyll, you know that part of the plant that combines CO2 and water for photosynthesis? It's almost identical to a blood pigment, pigment molecule found in humans. The main difference between this chlorophyll and a blood pigment is that blood has iron and chlorophyll has magnesium. So plants are technically alive 
and almost all scientists today agree with the theory that living organisms derived from one single cell. Now based on this theory that is wi widely recognized, plants are related to us. We're still working to understand how plants interact and function, just as how we don't necessarily understand everything that goes on in the human body. We don't know everything about eukaryotic cells, that is protists like algae or animals, plants, and fungi. Now, it is the only part of witchcraft, unless you work with other people, sea organisms, with animal parts, or with blood, which some pagans and witches use, Everything else in the craft is a non-living compound, such as crystals, stones, water, metals, or working on a higher level with a higher power or a consciousness. Working with herbs is a very grounding experience because of this. It's another organism that lives on the same biosphere as you and me, hopefully. It's another organism that lives on the same earthly level as we do. So to work with certain herbs is to technically incorporate anatomy into your practice along with other energy, their vibe, and their essential being. I mean, it's pretty neat to think about. Now, if you are not a reader and you're still watching, I have a suggestion for you based off of one of my Instagram followers who I didn't think about this before I did this video and I think it's a great tip, so I'm gonna include it here. Try some oracle cards. Oracle cards is a great idea for learning about herbs if you're not necessarily a reader. Um, you can kind of pull a card a day and learn about a certain plant. There's a lot of different herbalism cards out there. I did leave two links below. Um, one is really expensive but it's so pretty. Now if you want to do some more research on your own time because that is the best way to learn, I suggested a couple books to you and here they are. Now, I mentioned this in the welcome video to this series, so I'm just going to put an image of it right here. I'm not gonna talk about it because you can go back and listen to me talk about it there. If you have purchased it or if you have started to read it based on that video, oh my God, how did you like it? Do you love it? Like, is it really good? Is it really interesting? Isn't it really interesting? Now, I'm pretty sure this is the most common book to own amongst herbalists everywhere. It's a fantastic collection of plants and their medicinal properties. It also includes a few recipes towards the back. It's seriously my go-to book. I picked this up before any other book. Now I actually um, inherited this from my grandmother. Um, so it's a very old book. When was this published? This says 1974. And I'm not saying anyone that was born in 1974 is old. I'm just saying it's not a new book. Now, this book is not just for green witches. You know, I actually skimmed through this while I was researching for this video, and I have read it before, almost about a year ago, and I completely forgot like how relevant and so much information is in this small little book. It's definitely one of my favorite herbalist books. She has an index in the back for herbs and their magical properties. She does a great job explaining things and pointing out all the different ways green witches believe or what they um, kind of use in their witchcraft. Now, I'm in the process of still reading this book, but I love it, it's great. He covers so many different herbs and other things like lore and remedies and sketches of a few of a few of them. He even has the law of traditional herbalist in here. It's great. I highly recommend you read it and if you do it now you can read it with me and then we can fangirl about it. Wouldn't that be great? Now this book, if you want just like basically a coffee table book about herbalism, like pick it up because it is thick. This can be purchased if you need a big book of herbs. It also has really interesting history in here. Like if you've seen my Instagram TV videos on the wild herbs that I do, I quoted this book on the history of Britain drinking catnip tea. It's pretty interesting. If you've got a few herbs you want to expand your knowledge on, skimming through this book is a fantastic option. Now here's an honorable mention here. It's not necessarily an herbalism book. However, there is a section in this book on chapter four and it's called Nature's Magic, and it talks about the use of herbs for a very basic beginner, and I highly recommend you get this book because there's a, it's a really good book, actually. She, does a, she covers a lot of different things, not just with herbalism, but with witchcraft in general. Now, there are a few other books that I have read 
about craft work and herbalism. However, I didn't incorporate them in here because personally, I don't really think that they're worth purchasing or worth buying. They do provide some false knowledge um, on the craft and if you do want to know those books that I've read that I don't recommend, um, please message me. I don't want to give a bad vibe out there because if you have read one of those these books and do really like it, I don't want to offend you or just start an argument with you. But for me personally they didn't really they didn't really work but if you have any other rec book recommendations of your own please leave them below so other people can check them out plus I'm always on the lookout for new books whether it's herbalism or craft work or just in general I used to work at a bookshop for like four years so I'm pretty savvy on my books I mean I have one bookshelf behind me but then there's three others in my room so yeah and just so you know, this is a really dumb quirk about me. This bookshelf is for all of my childhood books. I have my Harry Potter books and my Mockingjay, my Hunger Game books, and then I have the um, Narnia books down here and Jules Verne. And I don't know why, but I have Frank Kos Kafka's Metamorphosis in there. Don't ask why. But I keep them separate from um, my non-fiction books and my female studies books and my yoga books and um yeah <laughs> I don't know why I divide them that way but I like it <laughs> actually kind of a side note here if you have any book recommendations on hedge witchery I would really love to read that um yeah dude let me know so can you see why I divided this into two separate parts instead of one really long video? In the next video, I'll be explaining more on the common tools of herbalism, the prep work involved in drying and storing, and also I'll give you a couple tips on how to grow and also which plants to start off with if you're a beginner practitioner. And I've included a couple tips in this video and in the next video from other practitioners out there uh, that were really kind to help me out in giving you some great suggestions and great advice. Um, so thank you, Instagram friends. You guys rock. And below, I'll link the sources that I've used for this video. I really hope you enjoyed what I went over today. Whether you're an intermediate, an expert, or a complete beginner, I hope you learned at least one new thing that you didn't know before this video. Leave me a thumbs up so I'm encouraged to make more videos, and I'll see you in the next one.